Okay, we should be live now. So you guys are ready to feel free to start whenever. Alrighty. Well, <laughs> hi everyone. <laughs> um, we are excited to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Nilav Anwar, and uh, this is my husband, Dr. Cyrus Agdam. Hi everyone. Um, we're excited to be here and just talk to you guys about our journeys and um, about our field. So feel free to ask us any questions you guys have um, after the presentation. So a little bit about ourselves. Um, so we met in ortho residency fall of 2018. So Cyrus was actually a year ahead of me at the time. Um, a year later, uh, we were engaged and we had a small little uh, wedding ceremony that year. And hopefully this summer we'll have our reception. Um, fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So in our free time, I mean, we love playing tennis, golf, um, exercising, traveling, and spending time with family and friends. Um, and then you'll also notice that we are from different ends of the country. Cyrus is from Maryland, D.C. area, and I'm from Southern California. So um, you guys will learn more about that. All right. So um, just, you know, before we even get started, um, it's really important to know that, like, there are so many different pathways uh, to becoming a dentist or an orthodontist or any specialist um, of your choosing. And it's important to know that your journey is your own and you shouldn't try to, like, uh, worry about what anybody else is doing. Um, for us, we had very different journeys. And um, even though both of us kind of went straight through school, um, from college uh, to dental school to uh, specialty residency. Um, there are so many different ways to get to the same goal. Um, so just kind of like enjoy the moment um, and just make sure that, uh, you know, no matter what you're doing, uh, that you're like taking time to enjoy your life as well. Okay. Um, so a little bit about myself. I grew up in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area uh, in Bowie, Maryland. I went to uh, Gonzaga High School in Washington, D.C. Um, it was like a private all boys school. And then I went to the University of Maryland uh, for undergrad. And then I went to Maryland for dental school as well. Uh, and then the first time I ever really like moved out of the state was for residency to go to Eastman for our orthodontics program. Yeah. And then um, myself, I was born in San Diego, California, um, grew up in Orange County. Um, then we moved north of San Diego in Temecula, it's called. Um, it's a small little town, went to high school there. Um, for my undergrad, I commuted from home, went to a local state university, also north of San Diego, Cal State San Marcos. And then for dental school, um, got in right away, went to USC in Los Angeles, and then um, got into ortho residency. And um, that's where we met at Eastman Institute for Oral Health in Rochester, New York, which is in upstate New York. Um, and then like Cyrus was saying, um, you'll notice that we did go straight through school, um, but we have friends, I mean, who've applied to dental school two or three times, or they worked for a year before dental school. Um, we know general dentists who now have been practicing for two years, and now they're applying um, to be a specialist. So, so many people have different journeys, and there's no right or wrong. So just so you guys yeah. know that. One of, one of my co-residents, he, um, in our specialty training, he was actually a general dentist for, I think, 17 years oh, in, yeah. in Iraq. Um, and then the war happened and he had to flee. And then many years later, he finally, like, became an orthodontist um, in my class. And, like, there's just so many different ways to kind of get to where you want to be. So just don't, don't worry too much if you don't get there right away. Um, the key is to be persistent. Right. So uh, like we had discussed earlier, uh, I went to the University of Maryland. I graduated in 2013. Uh, I was a bioengineering major, which definitely made things a little bit more challenging um, just because I had to uh, take additional science courses in addition to the already tough engineering workload. Uh, but I think it did pay off for me um, having that background, um, especially for orthodontics. Um, you know, being able to problem solve and kind of see uh, things from a different perspective, uh, I think is very useful. Um, and honestly, no matter what you major in in college, it doesn't really matter for dental school. Um, as long as you do well um, for your science GPA, you do well in the BAT, 
um, it, you could be um, a sculpture major. One of my uh, classmates in dental school was a, literally a sculpture major and she was top of our class and she had the most beautiful work. And so it really doesn't matter what you major in as long as you get the good grades. Um, in addition to that, uh, I spent a lot of time at the Pre-Dental Society. I was like the vice president and treasurer of that society at Maryland. Um, and I did a lot of uh, time volunteering and I know it's difficult for you guys shadowing right now, but I was shadowing at like several different offices back then when things were a little bit easier. Um, and I, I do think that that's important just because at least for dental school, it's a very big commitment and they just want to make sure that you know what you're getting yourself into. That's kind of the bottom line. Um, they don't expect you to like know every little thing about dentistry, but they want you to know um, kind of what you're signing up for, because once you get in there, um, dental school isn't always the easiest and they just don't want you to like get in there and then quit essentially. Okay. Um, but um, you can see like my GPA and my scores and stuff like that. Um, honestly, it's, it's not everything uh, to have perfect grades and perfect score, but it does help. Um, having that will make things much easier for you. Um, you'll be more likely to get more interviews, and the more interviews you have, the better chance you have of getting it. Yeah, so I went to Cal State San Marcos, graduated in 2014. Um, my major was biology with an emphasis in physiology. Um, I was in the pre-dental society, had tons of different leadership roles. I was a STEM tutor, so in my free time, I like tutored in biology and chemistry. And then like Cyrus was saying, I was shadowing um, many different dentists and a few orthodontists at the time. And um, each week I would go to like a low income dental clinic and teach like oral hygiene or assist the general dentist there. So that was that was really helpful. Um, and then again, if you want to go to dental school right after undergrad, um, I took the DAT exam my third year. So you have to take it a year before you graduate. Um, so it was helpful just kind of, kind of having a timeline. So you're doing things in a timely manner. And otherwise, some, some of my friends, they had to wait a year um, because they didn't take the DAT third year. So just to kind of keep in mind. Um, so as far as dental school goes, I mean, one, once you get in, um, Dental school really isn't, um, it's not super difficult, the material, but it's a lot. Um, people always say, or they joke that it's like drinking from like a fire hose. So like you are just getting so much material, like in college, um, we were typically taking like maybe 15 credit hours, but in dental school, like each semester was closer to like 25 credit hours. So it was just a, a lot more work, but it wasn't difficult. Um, you know, a lot of it was like the basic biology stuff that you guys have already done like a hundred different times. Um, you know, in addition to that, um, I knew pretty early on that I was interested in orthodontics. Um, so that definitely helped as well. Uh, but it's important to be open to other specialties, um, you know, and it's, in terms of applying to dental school, I definitely wouldn't recommend going and telling them, you know, at your dental school interview that, oh, I want to be an orthodontist or anything like that, because right now you're applying for dental school. And while it's fine for you to want to be an orthodontist, um, it's important that you're okay with being a dentist because it's very challenging to get into ortho residency. Um, and they want to make sure that, you know, you like dentistry as well, um, since that's what you're going to be doing for the next four years. Um, you know, I, I was involved in many different organizations, same as college, you know, you want to be involved in uh, community service and leadership. Um, for orthodontics specifically, you typically have to take the GRE. Uh, I'm not sure why, but you do. So you can really take that at any point um, during dental school, uh, you know, whenever you have free time. Um, and then in addition to that, it's typically good to be involved in some sort of research project. Um, if you're interested in ortho, they tend to look favorably on that. Uh, I wasn't always the biggest person on research. Uh, you know, I'd like to spend more of my time doing community service and that was fine. I just didn't apply to as many schools that were uh, heavy into research for ortho. Yeah, and then for me, I went to um, USC in Los Angeles, graduated in 2018. Um, so like Cyrus said, um, just try to keep your grades up, um, volunteer, try to have leadership roles and shadow. In dental school, this is where, you know, you if you want to specialize, then shadow 
the specialist that you want. So I shadowed many different orthodontists. If you don't know what you want to specialize in, I mean, this is the perfect time, first or second year, um, whether it's oral surgery, pedo, um, just go for it and shadow in your free time while you can. Um, research, I was involved in a few projects, but nothing too intense. Um, I was published, I had one paper published, um, and then a little bit, like I was saying, is to just have a timeline um, for ortho I wanted to get in right away, at least that was my hope. Um, so I applied at least a year before I graduated, and um, I also made a spreadsheet of all the ortho programs and their requirements, because not every program requires the GRE. Um, some programs, when I was applying, needed the ADAT, which is a new exam. Um, it just varies, so it's good to just keep everything organized and know the requirements um, for all the different programs that you apply to. GRE, I took early second year just to like have and be done with. And then also make sure you're developing relationships like with your faculty and you have people that can write you a nice letter of recommendation and kind of have a nice CV um, and update it throughout your years in dental school. But like Cyrus was saying, it, it was not easy. Um, I had like 140 people in my class and you have like all these different students with you that want to specialize and I just kind of kept my head down and um, just worked hard you don't need to like tell people you know right away that you're gung-ho with a certain um, specialty you just kind of work hard and um, you know wherever you're meant to be that will happen absolutely <laughs> kind of thing. yeah like, I for, for me, at least, like, I, I didn't even know, like, my class rank until, like, I was going to apply for ortho, because I just didn't even want to yeah. think about it. I just went in and I just, like, tried my best, and I got good grades and everything, um, but I just did not want to be focused on that, because right. too many people, like, obsess over that, and mm -hmm. definitely, if you want to do ortho, I mean, you need to be towards the top of your class, because it's very competitive, um, but it's not the most important thing. It's, it's good to be well-rounded. Um, and especially like volunteering, you know, once you guys, I know it's tough right now to get shadowing positions, but once you're in dental school, um, you'll be able to kind of shadow the different specialties. And I think that that's a really good way to kind of figure out what you like to do. Um, you know, uh, I was very close to doing oral surgery, actually. Um, and I like had to make up my mind at the last minute. So the sooner you kind of know exactly what you want to do, the easier it's going to be, because then you can kind of uh, take those steps and plan ahead. So then uh, we both ended up at uh, Eastman in Rochester, New York. Uh, you know, it's funny because, so I'm from DC and I had like never really left the state of Maryland and she was from California. And this program is like one of the best in the country. And we were both just lucky enough to be accepted here. Um, you know, it, it's a two year program, which is nice because a lot of ortho programs are three years. So you get to finish almost like a year early. Um, in addition to that, like it's a paid program. So um, they don't have like a tuition, like some ortho uh, residencies out there, which can be very pricey. So it's very hard to get into, but we were both super fortunate. Um, and we got a great uh, training there. Uh, we both started about 80 to 90 cases. Um, which is a lot for orthodontics. Um, you know, it's it's basically what you do in ortho is you have to learn how to diagnose and treatment plan and put the braces on and treat the patients and take the braces off. So um, we got really, really good clinical experience while we were there. Yeah, um, residency was great because it's like you're finally in the, at the end of your career and you're doing what you've always dreamed of doing. So you're treating ortho patients, you're in an intimate setting. So my class is on the bottom. We are a class of six, same with Cyrus. And it's just very intimate. You develop relationships like with your faculty. And these are like long-term friendships too. Um, so it's really nice. Um, you do a research project and some presentations, didactics, while also treating patients. It's not too bad at all, and it's actually really enjoyable. So yeah, Re residency is a lot of yeah. fun. You know, once you get to that point, like all the competition is kind of out the window. Right. Like in dental school, everybody's like a little bit competitive, but in residency, I mean, me and my co-residents, we were just like best friends. We hung out every day. I mean, it was it. You had to do your work and everything, but it was kind of like having a job. You know, you got to go home and, right. and relax, and it wasn't as stressful. You know, as like college or dental school or anything. That so, um, it's kind of like the you made it moment, right. and you can kind of enjoy uh, being there. 
So these are just a couple um, moments. Like it's nice, you know, once you're in residency, you get to go on all these uh, like fun sponsored trips and everything. So this photo on the left is uh, from our GORP trip, which is where all the residents from all the ortho programs uh, in the country get to go uh, for free. And, you know, it's just like a big uh, get together and they host these different events for us. So um, it's a lot of fun. And this is, um, on the right is everybody at the Eastman Clinic. And actually, um, the gentleman right here, I don't know if you guys can see the cursor, but right here, this is Dr. Malloy. So he was like our faculty there. And I mean, we've just become so close with him. I mean, we get together um, for dinners with him and his wife. And it's like you become a family at that point. So it's really, really nice. This was our graduation, so mine It's on the funny because you could see the difference. Yeah, hers was during COVID, so <laughs> she had a socially yeah. distant graduation where they were all wearing masks, but it was still special, I think. Um, so do you want to talk about? Yeah, so just some advice um, for pre-dental students. We touched on some of these, but again, just staying organized. Um, shadowing different fields. So having an idea of what you want to do when you enter dental school will help a lot. Um, so deep down in my heart, I mean, I've wanted to do ortho since, I mean, maybe high school and college. I've always loved it. And so I, it, it helped, you know, and I had that deep down ingrained in my heart, everything. So I, you know, put my head down and really just worked hard to achieve that goal. Um, you know, but it really helps. It made a difference because even though it might be tough, you will achieve that goal if you really um, work hard. And then just being involved and well-rounded. Um, so in academia, leadership roles, volunteering and service projects. So ortho is different because we like a well-rounded applicant. Um, we want to see, even at the interviews that you go on for orthodontic residency, um, they just want to know that you're normal, you're friendly, you're, you really love what you do um, because they want to see if they can teach you, you know, full on 24 seven. And they want to see how you'll be with the patients. Um, we'll talk a lot about our day, um, you know, our typical day in ortho, but you'll see that it's a lot of talking, going chair to chair. And so that's a big, big deal in our field. Yeah. Um, and then just don't forget to enjoy the process and journey because time really does fly. So just keep yeah. that in mind. And, and just make sure to, you know, have some sort of um, healthy stress release, oh, yeah. like, yeah. you know, working That's out or wh whatever it is, um, cooking, whatever you like to do, just because um, dental yeah. school can become stressful at times. Um, and you kind of have to have a way to kind of like just relax um, and kind yeah. of enjoy the moment because some, some of our best memories are from dental school right. um, so you know definitely stop and enjoy the moment too while you're there yeah so now we'll go into our field so orthodontics not only do we deal with misaligned teeth but also misaligned bite patterns and jaws so we can diagnose we can prevent intercept and treat dental and facial irregularities um, we treat existing problems and we can identify problems that are developing and it's nice because we can also take timely action to resolve problems before they get worse. Um, we treat patients of all ages, which is really nice, uh, children, teens, and even adults. So you guys probably know us as the ones to put on braces. Um, we do put on braces, uh, clear aligners in many cases. We also see children. So as young as seven to like nine years old, we can do phase one or early treatment for them. Um, we can prevent issues that can potentially become worse. So I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here, but I'll show you a case later on. Um, this is called a crossbite, and you can see that the top teeth are behind the bottom teeth, and as this person is biting up and down, there's a potential or chance that these teeth can become loose um, if they keep hitting on those bottom teeth. So it's nice that we can prevent that um, at a really young age for them. And then we can also work with the oral surgeon uh, in cases that require jaw surgery. So you can see in this picture, if a person's lower jaw is too far out, protruded, or too far back, retruded, we can help them with that. And uh, we'll show you cases later on as well. So a day in the life of an orthodontist. So what you see in this picture, um, it's a lot of talking to patients, 
critically thinking on the fly, uh, diagnosing and treatment planning. So currently we work in a large pediatric practice. Um, we're two of the three orthodontists there. And uh, we work four days a week. We're off uh, most Fridays. Um, in the mornings, we have bonding appointments, consultations. In the afternoon, we have retainer checks, adjustments, which will go into um, records. We see 50 to 75 patients a day, um, but there are some offices that can see as many as 100 to 120 patients a day, depending on how they are set up. So each ortho office is different. Um, having a good staff is so important because they're the ones that allow us to see the, that many patients. Um, one of the real benefits of orthodontics is that it's not as physically demanding and strenuous as general dentistry or other specialties because our assistants are able to do most of the work. So our real, jo our real job is to diagnose and treatment plan so that you know, we can delegate the tasks and move on with the day. So we're so grateful for our assistants and staff because they really help the day go by in an efficient manner. And it's not strenuous on your body. So as a woman personally, um, especially like if I want future kids, it's just, it's nice because as an orthodontist, you have that luxury to maybe work three or four days a week and it's not strenuous on your body. And it's, it's really great. So like I said, um, we're part of a large pediatric practice. Um, we have three different ortho locations right now. Um, we like to start early uh, in the day, 7.30 to 5, um, typically is our end time. And like I said, we have different appointment types, but this is just kind of how we break down the day. So bondings, the consult adjustments in the morning, and then the afternoon, we see pretty much anything except not really uh, bondings in the afternoon. So new patient consult. So this is huge um, in our field because we see tons of consults every day. Um, they could be children, teens, or adults who visit the orthodontist for the first time. So maybe they've been referred by their dentist or another specialist, or maybe there's something that they don't like about their smile and they just want to fix it, or maybe they just simply want more um, information. So typically for us, we take a panoramic x-ray for the consult, and if they want to sign up for treatment, at the next visit, we'll take photos, um, a cephalometric x-ray, and we'll put the braces on that same day. If they are a candidate for clear liners, then we'll take a 3D scan with our TRIO scanner. Um, so there's many 3D scanners out there, but really we really love our three-shape scanner, um, so it's really, really cool. We'll go into that as well um, later on. So for bonding appointments, so this is uh, the exciting day because this is when the braces are um, being put on. It, it is a longer appointment because there's a lot involved. Um, we have to go through several steps to prepare the tea so that the braces stay on. Um, we etch, we wash, dry, we use a primer before placing the braces on. Um, these are actually steps similar to uh, doing a filling in general dentistry, but the materials are a little different in terms of the concentrations. Um, there's some that are specific to our field. And then it's super important to do a really good job and um, make sure this is done well because placing the braces in the right position will make the treatment go more efficiently. Um, another super exciting day is the debond appointment. Um, that's when the braces are being taken off. So this is awesome because you can see a lot of the patients just glowing and they're so excited, happy. You can see their personality completely change. Um, so that's super gratifying for us. But we have like uh, special instruments to take the braces off. Um, it is painless. It's super quick. We just polish everything off. Our assistants do. And then we take final photos, um, final 3D scan, and then give them the retainers um, the following week. And then these are adjustments. So we have adjustment appointments. For those of you who've had braces, it's the appointment um, known as like changing the colors, if you guys remember. So at these visits, it's very important because this is where all the work gets done. Um, we see our patients every four to eight weeks, depending on the stage of treatment that they're in. And we're making changes to the braces as we go. So as an orthodontist, this is where good diagnosis and treatment planning is really, really crucial because every time you see a patient for a visit, you have to see what stage they're at and then decide what's, what has to be done next. 
So I won't go into this too much, but it's nice to see, you know, what is what. You have a little power chain to close spaces. You have the colors, which are also called O-rings or O-ties, um, the arch wire, uh, molar bands, and stuff like that. And we have our treatment, like our wire sequence here, but that's just pretty much showing how we progress um, with the patient's treatment. And there's different materials of wires and all of that, which you'll learn in residency. Yeah, so other appointments we have, um, so retainer checks. Um, they are very important because if a patient is not wearing their retainer, their teeth will shift and move and they'll need to go back into braces actually to straighten them again or clear liners. Um, we have record appointments, so that can be a scan, photos, just some x-rays, observation appointments where we see if they're ready for braces, um, appliance checks, so the patient could be wearing an expander, you can see here um, in the lower left, just to see if the expander has widened their jaw or not, um, typically we use those for younger kids. And then emergency appointments. So we are very, very lucky um, that there are no serious emergencies in orthodontics. Uh, the most we'll ever have is a broken brace or a poking wire, all of which can be taken care of very quickly to make the patient more comfortable. Um, this is very different from other professions such as medicine, uh, where you have to be on call at the hospital. All right, so uh, just kind of going into um, like the salary and you know all of that, um, you know one of the real benefits to orthodontics is that you can really do whatever you want um, and you can still make like a decent living. Um, you know there's a lot of different options and pathways. So the most popular is to be um, in a private orthodontic office. Um, you know, typically uh, the pay as an associate for something like this is about $1,000 to $1,200 per day. Um, and you can kind of see what the, the salary ranges are for that per year. Um, it really just depends on how many days a week you're willing to work. So, for instance, my, my orthodontist that I grew up going to, he was only working three days a week. So, I mean, that's really nice. Um, that he's able to do that and he has that flexibility. Some ortho offices are open four days a week, some are open five days a week, some are only open two days a week. So one of the benefits is that you really get to choose exactly how much you wanna work. And again, that of course affects how much uh, you're gonna make, but um, it's nice to have that flexibility that you know if you do have kids and maybe you wanna spend more time with the kids or um, anything like that, or you have a certain hobby that you like to do, then you're able to have that flexibility and um, you know, that lifestyle that uh, suits you best. Um, definitely, you can make more if you go work for like a larger corporation. Um, around there, it's like $1,200 to $1,700 a day, depending on where you are. Um, so like larger cities like New York City or LA, they typically will make a little bit less. Um, and then if you're somewhere more rural where the demand is higher, then you can typically make more. Um, really, though, what most people aspire to is being the practice owner, um, because this is where you can easily um, get into the millions uh, if you run a really well, uh, successful practice. Um, and again, this is like before all your business expenses and everything. But um, again, you, you kind of have control over uh, your work schedule as well as how you practice. And so that's why I think there's probably the biggest benefit to doing that. Um, aside, aside from all those options, you could always do uh, academia and teach um, or uh, work in a residency program as well. So, I mean, one of the things that I'm super excited about for orthodontics is all the cool technology uh, that's coming our way. So, I mean, being an uh, engineering background, um, I always found this stuff really fascinating and you know, I never thought that we would have this stuff in orthodontics uh, when I was initially interested in it in high school. Um, you know, we had uh, the TRIOS 3-shape scanner, which Dr. Anwar mentioned earlier. And, you know, what that allows us to do is, you know, a patient comes in and we don't have to take any of those goopy molds anymore. Um, I, myself, am somebody who, like, gags when they do that. So I'm very, very thankful that we have this technology now. And after you've had, like, a kid throw up on you because, like, they were gagging, like, you'll be super thankful, too, that you don't have to do that anymore. But so it's really nice um, technology. And it allows us to get a very clean, accurate scan. It's way more accurate um, than any uh, impression would do. 
Um, and in addition to that, everything can be stored digitally. So, you know, back in the olden days, like an orthodontist would have like a whole like room full of like models and everything like that. Now with uh, these types of technologies, we can store everything on the cloud, um, which is really nice because if a patient, let's say, um, you know, they got their braces off and we scan them for retainers uh, and let's say they lost the retainer, they wouldn't necessarily need to come into the office to get a new one or get a new mold because we have the scan saved digitally. So we could just order them a new retainer and just have it mailed to them. Let's say if they were away at college or anything like that. So um, the technology is, is great uh you know it definitely is a little bit pricey but that being said the, the costs are coming dramatically down um 3d printing has just kind of entered the profession so uh, we are getting a 3d printer in our office and we'll be able to do our own custom aligners like the clear aligners um, that we can print ourselves customized for our patients um, and that's again something else that's like kind of going to be the future of orthodontics as well i mean 3d printing um is super cool and like with in conjunction with the scanner we can scan anything we want and then simply print that uh, and then make whatever we need to for our patients so honestly I, th I think the future of orthodontics is very bright i know a lot of people um at least who are kind of getting into the field are always a little bit worried about uh the do-it-yourself companies like um small direct club and all of them but um Really, I, I think technology is only going to get better and it's going to help uh, the profession grow if you're willing to um, adapt and change and embrace the technology. Uh, and I think as like the younger generation, we're very um, adept at doing this. We're able to kind of uh, be more tech savvy than a lot of uh, the older doctors because that's what we grew up with. We don't even think twice about it. I mean, you guys put together this Zoom um, and YouTube stuff, and I, I know like most adults wouldn't be able to do that. So um, I, I think that the future is very bright for orthodontics um, and technology is going to play a huge role um, in addition uh, to that. So the most important thing is really just to set yourself yeah. apart um, and kind of like know who you are um, and what makes you know you special. Um, you should never really try to like uh, worry about what anybody else is doing. Um, you should just kind of focus on your own strengths as an individual. So Dr. Enwar is going to go over some cases now. Is. Yeah, so generally patients could come in with different different problems. So it could be crowding, it could they could have an overbite, an underbite, or even an open bite. So this case on the left here, you can see on the top um, how she presented with a lot of overlapping of the teeth, a lot of crowding, and then you can see where she finished on the bottom. And then on the right, you can see two early treatment cases, which is what I was talking about earlier. So early treatment or phase one. Um, on the top right, you can see an anterior crossbite. So I don't know if you can see the lower gum line on the two lower teeth. Again, if they were to keep you know, hitting on this or if we were to leave it alone, sometimes this could get worse and those teeth can get loose on the bottom. And then on the lower right photo, so this patient had a um, open bite from a thumb sucking habit, and we use an appliance and braces on those four front teeth and then two in the back to help correct this. And so for this, for this patient in particular, the one with the open bite, um, you know, he was getting teased at school and he was having trouble eating um, normally because he wasn't able to bite into things with his front teeth. So. Um, I mean, when he finished, um, you can kind of see the photo right here. He was like so happy and ecstatic and he just was so excited to go and be able to eat like pizza, like normally, like a normal kid. So um, it's really, um, it's really rewarding, you know, the difference we can make in our patients' lives as an orthodontist. And I think that's probably like the best part of the field, like Dr. Mm -hmm. Ann was talking about earlier. You know, the most exciting part is when we get to take their braces off and like sometimes they'll cry or they'll scream or they'll just be so happy. Um, it's really exciting for us as well to be able to see that. Yeah, especially on those patients, like where they're getting teased at school, like that, that breaks my heart. So yeah. just being able to help with that is, is really awesome. So. So this case, um, this was a surgical case of mine in residency. So you can see starting at the facial photos, so her side profile, um, she wasn't happy with like her profile and how her lower jaw was too far out. And then also her bite. So her big concern is her underbite. She was saying that was uncomfortable and really, really hard to eat and 
you know, that was her really, really big concern there. So with surgical cases, as the orthodontist, so pretty much what we do is we put braces on the teeth, make sure everything's nicely leveled for them. And then we pretty much send them to surgery and then they come see us after the jaw surgery has been done. And we're the ones who do the finishing and detailing. So whether it's rubber bands and stuff like that. In this photo, you can also see she has what we call peg laterals. So smaller shaped uh, laterals, which is like mainly genetic. But um, yeah, she wasn't really happy with that. And then take a look after surgery. So you can see a huge improvement with her bite, um, which was awesome. She was super, super happy. Um, she still has the small laterals here. Um, in this case, typically we send them to like a general dentist or prosthodontist to help kind of restore and uh, build those teeth up. And you can see this is um, after surgery. And then you can also see her post buildups, which is um, just a huge, huge difference. Um, with profile and then also her bite. Yeah. And then this was another um, case of mine. So you can see his big underbite there. Um, this was more of a like kind of a dental um, issue rather than a skeletal issue. So we thought we can you know correct this with braces and we wanted to try um, an appliance for him, which I'll show you guys. Um, this is a radiograph uh, we used in residency. It's called um, the skeletal maturation index. So you can assess the skeletal maturity of an individual, which is pretty cool from this hand wrist radiograph. So this patient, for example, he was nearing the end of his growth. So it's pretty cool. And then this is a lateral cephalogram. So in residency, you'll learn how to hand trace these and digitally trace these. So all these lines that you can see, they signify different measurements. Um, again, you'll learn all of this in residency, but um, it's really, really nice because it helps to treatment plan different cases. And you can see this is like a list of a lot of the different measurements you can kind of study and these help treatment plan again different cases like I said and they show maybe the angulation of the teeth or the position of the jaws so there's just a lot a lot to look at to really make a nice treatment plan for our patients. And you don't have to like read into yeah. this too much or worry yeah, about yet. this. Mm -hmm. um, I know it looks like a lot of numbers yeah. and overwhelm, but basically it's just to give you like a general idea of like, hey, like this might be this way because of this, or maybe we can do this in this case. And it kind of just gives you like little hints, um, you know, as the orthodontist, um, it's really mostly a thinking game, which is kind of why I liked having that engineering background is it's all problem solving, you know, a case comes in and you kind of have to figure out, hey, what am I going to do here? Um, you know, why might this work? Why might not? this might not work so um it's a lot of fun you know we get something different you know even though a lot of the, the cases you know you put braces on almost every patient um each case is a little bit different you can kind of like uh figure out like what little nuances and problems there are yeah so it was nice for him we used uh, what we call a carrier appliance so you can see that lower uh, metal bar on the bottom teeth with rubber bands to help correlate and correct his jaw relationship um, so i really like this appliance it, it worked really nicely um, yeah so this is uh, the last time i saw him you can see i mean nice profile big improvement and then huge improvement with his bite so that was really really awesome Another case here, just so you guys can see a lot of crowding, um, you can see on the top and bottom teeth. And then in this case, especially um, her top and bottom teeth were what we call proclined or really flared out. So you have to be careful and make sure you control it nicely. And um, what we decided uh, with my faculty member was to um, take out a lower incisor. So we call it like a lower incisor extraction case. And you can see kind of the progress photos on the top I mean, you pretty much can't tell. Um, and then, I mean, when they finish, it's going to look beautiful. But this is kind of where we, um, the last time I saw her. So this is like always a nice treatment option. And it really helps you um, control, again, the flaring of the teeth as well. In this case, um, so really interesting. So starting on the top photo here. So take a look at her lower jaw, how far back and retruded it is. 
Um, and then you can see a lot of crowding as well, even though um, it doesn't look like it. On the x-ray, her teeth are very far forward. They're proclined. Um, you can see it on the x-ray as well, okay? Um, so in this case, um, extractions were done of um, teeth. So two teeth on the top were taken out, two teeth on the bottom. And then also an appliance was used called a herpst appliance. And this herpst appliance, it's called like a functional appliance. And you'll learn more about this in residen residency, but they're pretty much used in growing patients uh, to aid in the correction of jaw growth discrepancies. So the framework, so you can see in that photo, the metal frameworks, they're connected by almost like a telescopic uh, mechanism that kind of aids in modifying their occlusion or bite. Um, and it kind of exerts an upward and backward force to the upper jaw and then a forward force on the lower jaw. So these types of appliances work really well um, with the patient's um, inherent growth to affect the desired changes. And this is why it's important to do uh, most functional appliances around puberty when they have good uh, growth potential. And you can see, I mean, where she finished, which I mean, looks really, really good. And you can see, you know, her bite is nicely, you know, socked in and comfortable on both sides. It, and you can take a look at her profile as well. So take a look at her lower jaw on the top photo and how how more balanced she looks yeah, in so that photo. Yeah, so part of the goal here is to use natural growth um, in order to kind of uh, help the lower jaw kind of come forward so that she's not as, uh, her lower jaw isn't set far, as far back there. Um, and that's why, you know, as an orthodontist, it's important to take those uh, growth x-rays so we can yeah. kind of evaluate when they're hitting that growth spurt so we can take advantage of that. Yeah, and then to kind of um, end our presentation, just some general advice is do not give up. Um, at some points in my career, I thought being an orthodontist, it was impossible. Um, but I just really, really pushed myself and kind of followed my dreams. And it really, even as cliche as that sounds, really, really follow your dreams. Do not give up. Um, don't compare yourself to others, especially dental school. That is like super detrimental. So um, yeah. just kind of stay true to yourself and really just, you, you know, you can achieve anything you set your mind to. Uh, timelines help me. I'm just, I love my planners. I love being organized. Yes. I know everyone's different. Like he like uses his phone to stay organized. Everyone's different, but it really helps because um, you want to do things in a timely manner. Absolutely. I mean, that's like part of the, the challenge, especially with orthodontics. Yeah. Um, not every specialty is like this, but orthodontics in particular, um, every residency program that you apply to is completely different in what they require. Some of them want your driver's license and some of them want uh, a completely different form. So uh, each one is totally different and you have to stay super organized because it's not like one central application like some of the other specialties are like for oral yeah. surgery or pediatric dentistry, for instance. Um, so that's one of the most challenging things about applying to ortho is that there's 60 something different programs and each one wants something completely different. Um, so I made like a, an Excel sheet that had like each program that I was going to apply to, what the requirements are, what their deadlines were. Um, some wanted the GRE, some didn't want that, some wanted the ADAT, like we had mentioned earlier. So those programs, since I didn't take it, I knew I wasn't going to apply to those. So it's important to know that before you spend all this money applying um, and especially all that time applying as well. Um, so just try to stay organized and, and stay positive. So Yeah, so um, we currently work in Buffalo, New York together. Um, those of you who don't know where Buffalo is, it's literally like an hour from Toronto, Canada. So we're way yeah, up we're right there. right up on Lake Erie. Yeah. Yeah, we can almost see the lake from our place. Right. So. Um, we just made a new professional page like a few months ago. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions you guys have on there. And um, we're excited for the future. So. Thank you guys. Yeah, and then we put our emails up and then also you can just message us. Message us yeah, if you guys page, ever have so. any questions about anything, feel free to email us and just you know, yeah. let us know. We're always happy to help out in any way. Thank you so any much. Questions? That um, it, uh, once again, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. That was like our first um, virtual session and it couldn't have been any better. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, 
uh, we can go into questions. We have some from Instagram and also the YouTube live. So I'll kind of handle the Instagram ones and then Mahira will do the YouTube live. Um, so as far as shadowing goes, like within um, undergrad and also dental school, what years do you recommend specifically shadowing? Um, and is there a difference between the two? So at least for undergrad, I don't really think it makes a difference when you do your shadowing. Um, I, I, I would do it. I would honestly do it every year if yeah. you can. I know right now you guys can't, but um, at least for me, I like had my general dentist who I knew very well and then my orthodontist as well. And so I shadowed like every summer basically, because that's honestly is the easiest time to shadow. So um, that's mainly when I was doing that. But I did that my freshman, sophomore, and junior year um, of college. Uh, but honestly, for me, I I enjoyed shadowing. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed doing that rather than like doing like a research project mm -hmm. or something like that, like I said earlier. Um, so you have to kind of find what you're passionate about and what you enjoy. I, I do think it's really, really important. So even though I knew I kind of wanted to do orthodontics, I shadowed an orthodontist. I actually shadowed a couple orthodontists, but I also spent a lot of my shadowing time in general dental offices because I was applying to dental school. And I think that that's super mm -hmm. important. So if you only have a specialty shadowing or letters of recommendation from only specialty specialists that may hurt your chances of getting into dental school you definitely want to have a letter of recommendation from a general dentist um, as well as um, shadowing at a general dental office because um, like we discussed earlier i mean that's kind of what you're applying for so when you go to do the dental school interviews um, and i know this because i was on the admissions committee and i would interview applicants at the dental school um, they really want to make sure that you're okay you want to do general dentistry first and foremost. So I think that that's super important. And then when it comes to dental school in general, I think shadowing, um, maybe not during your first year, you definitely should and you can, but first year you're typically typically pretty busy with classes. You just want to focus on getting good grades. Second year is really the time where you want to start shadowing heavily um, because you have to apply by third year. So you have to have made your mind up by then. So if you're just starting to shadow third year, you might be kind of getting to the game a little bit late. Um, so I think second year is yeah. really the best time. But first year, I would just focus on getting good grades. What do you think? Just you hit on everything. Yeah. So our next question is from YouTube, um, and they ask, how did your study habits change from undergrad and then going into dental school? That's tough. So my, my dental school, um, it was kind of like a different system. So it was problem-based learning. So we learned in like groups through cases um, every week. So my studying had to change a lot. Um, in undergrad, um, it was lecture-based. So we would go through lectures. I would take my notes, you know, maybe record it, come home, um, you know, go on my whiteboard dental school, it was like, I almost had to teach myself, um, but not every dental school is like that. So it was problem-based learning, learning from cases. I had to do research, um, learn from textbooks. And we did have a few lectures in dental school. It's not like we had, you know, no lectures, but um, it was different from undergrad to dental school. I mean, for you, it was- Yeah, I mean, not I'm not necessarily the best example. So like in college, because I was engineering, um, it wasn't as much studying as like solving problems and doing projects and things like that. So um, it was very different, I guess, going to dental school where it was just studying and kind of memorizing things for the most part. Um, but the nice thing is at Maryland where I went for dental school, um, all the lectures were recorded online. So a lot of times I didn't even really go to class. I would just watch the lectures online from like the comfort of my own home. And like, I would speed it up to two speed. And then I would just rewatch them as many times as I wanted to. And I would like pause and rewind if something didn't make sense. Um, and then just go in and ask the faculty if I had any questions. But um, I, I think really the biggest difference for me at least was that in dental school, it was just more uh, about like repetition. Um, whereas undergrad, um, like the engineering side of things was like a little bit more problem based for sure. Awesome. 
Okay, so like the next question has to do with exams. So obviously you have to take DAT to get into dental school. Once you're into dental school, what are the big um, exams you have to take? And like to com kind of compare it to medical school, they have to take like the step exam. So what would be the equivalent? Okay. Um, so for us in dental school, you have part one boards, um, part two boards, and then you have a licensure exam. So depending on the state, every state is different, but for me, um, in California, so it's like called the Western Regional Regional Examination. So that's when you know you do fillings on a patient, you do cleanings, and then you get your license in that state, your dental license to practice. And then you also have a small exam with that licensure, um, like the CTP or yeah. Um, but that's not as big. Um, they're, they're changing things though right yeah. now. So at least when we did it, you had to take part one of your boards after like your first year. And then you had to take part two of your boards with more like clinical based. So like the part one was more science based right. stuff, um, stuff that you kind of learned in like undergrad or, or first year of dental school. And then the clinical stuff was more just like dental, actual like real world dental issues. Um, and that you take like around your third or fourth year. And then like she was saying, like, depending on where you want to practice, you take like a licensure exam, but you don't take that until typically your yeah. fourth year as well. And that's mm -hmm. where you actually do a real filling on a person and right. it's like graded and um, you have to clean somebody's teeth and, and do a bunch of little uh, actual like procedures. Um, so those are kind of like the three big ones uh, that you have to do for like getting a license. Um, but in terms of like actual exams themselves in dental school, I'm not sure about how you had it, but like we had one almost like every week in a different, uh, in a different class. Like we mm -hmm. might have one in endodontics this week and then the next week we had one in, in uh, you know, dental anatomy or one in physiology. And so, um, you know, it was just a matter of kind of like staying on top of all those exams because it was just like one after another. It wasn't like college where you have like midterms and finals and like it was one back to back to back exams like that really had to get very efficient at like studying the material and figuring out how to prioritize like which exam you really need to focus on at that time. In a big comparison, I mean, dental school compared to med school, you have like clinical exams. So, you know, you have tests yeah. like lab exams on like how to do a filling, how to do a composite. So white filling uh, restoration, you have um, exams on crowns or, you know, a temporary crown. So, and it's timed. So those were stressful, but um, yeah. those are like, you know, you're always, the thing is in dental school, you have to manage your time with didactics and lab work so I was in the lab sometimes till like midnight um, yeah. you know trying to perfect you know my crown or different things like that it's so that's why um, compared to med school I mean dental school is has dental school is challenging because in medical school you can just focus on studying yeah. and, and doing well on exams which right. most of us already know from like college but in dental school you have to like go into the lab and practice yeah. and there were plenty of nights where like I would be there really late just practicing right. on those fake teeth and everything like that um, because those do factor into your grades as well so um, I do think that that's one thing that's sometimes overlooked um, as right. a challenge for dental school. Thank you. Um, so one of the basic um, questions we've been getting is um, what what made you choose dentistry over any other career um, and were, was there any moment that kind of solidified your decision? Um, yeah, so in terms of general dentistry, so I have a lot of aunts and uncles who are general dentists. So growing up, you know, seeing them and kind of, you know, always seeing them so happy. And um, we were able to go in their offices at a young age and um, started shadowing in like high school, uh, college. And then I was always interested, me and my sister, we love the idea of having braces. So we got braces in middle school. And, um, you know, when I got mine off, it was truly life changing. So that's when I was like, okay, I, I really want to be a part of this. And then when I shadowed orthodontists, probably early college time, that's when I realized I want to be in this profession. Um, just, you know, seeing the difference you can make on the patients, um, the good lifestyle you can have as an orthodontist. And um, it's just really, really rewarding. Yeah, I mean, for me, I my grandfather was a general dentist and I was really close with him and he loved it. Um, so I always was kind of interested in the profession. Uh, but in high school, I shadowed my orthodontist who was a friend of my dad. And 
I just, I was like, wow, this is the best job ever. You know, he's only working three days a week. I mean, he makes a decent living. He's helping people. People are just happy to see him. Nobody's like scared of going to the orthodontist. Like sometimes they're a little bit scared of the dentist. Um, But for the most part, you know, people are happy to go to the orthodontist. You know, you get to straighten their teeth, give them a beautiful smile. So it's just like a great profession and it has an amazing lifestyle. Um, but there was definitely, I mean, my family, at least like my dad wanted me to go to medical school and I had a lot of family members who were doctors, but you know, the more I looked into it and the more I talked with them, I felt like, you know, medicine is great, but you know, a lot of the times like they're overworked, you know, they have to be on call all the time going to the hospital. And there are definitely some specialties where you don't have to do that, like dermatology. Um, but I don't know, orthodontics just seemed like the best of everything to me. And so that's kind of why I wanted to do that. And general dentistry as well, like it was just a great profession. And I just, I think looking at everything, um, medicine versus dentistry, I just felt like dentistry was going to give me more of the lifestyle as well that I wanted. Um, And in dentistry, whether you become a specialist or not, you can own your own practice. And I think that that's one of the I think the coolest parts of being a dentist is being a business owner and a practice owner, because then you can really set um, set up your life how you want. You know, you choose which days you want to work, what hours you want to work, um, you know, how you want to practice. Uh, you know, if you want to have like cool technology in your office, you can do that. So it gives you a lot of freedom, and I think that reduces a lot of the stress in your life where you're not having to work for somebody else, but you can really work for yourself. Um, so I, I think that that's really important as well. Um, okay, moving on to our next question. This kind of has to do with the dental schools that you went to. So how were your individual experiences there? And how was like every year organized? What was the difference as you progressed through dental school for each school? Yeah, so for USC um, in Los Angeles, so the first year and second year are mainly didactic. So you're taking a lot of your classes learning a lot about like, you know, bio, biochemistry, it's just reviews. And then again, like I said, it was a lot of cases. So in these cases that we were studying, you're applying these different concepts. And then we would have a lot of exams. And then also that same time, so first and second year, we were doing our clinical side as well. So clinical exams, learning, I don't know if you guys know the silver fillings, the white fillings, crowns, um, just dentures, everything. So that the first two years are didactics. Third and fourth year, you go to the clinic. And this is the years I love the most That's because the stuff. <laughs> literally so fun and you're treating patients. So yeah, you're doing crowns, you're doing fillings. Um, you build relationships with your patients, which is great. And it's kind of like a little private practice, but you're not seeing that many patients yeah. um, in dental school. It's like two you or three You see like one day. or two patients. Yeah, one or two a day. day. <laughs> Um, but it's really, really nice. Third and fourth year um, was my favorite. And again, first and second year was just like lab, clinic, tests. And then in terms of the examination, so part one and part two boards, um, at my school, I think I took part one boards. Um, it was around second year, part two boards around third year. Yeah, for, yeah. for us, I mean, I don't know. I really love Maryland. It was a great dental school. Um, first year was almost all didactic. So it was like pathology, um, physiology, all your science courses. And we, we did like do some like little dental things, but it was mostly didactic. And that's the reason for that is that we took our uh, part one boards during the summer between our first and second year. So they gave us like the whole summer off and they were like, just take your boards and pass. Um, and then second year is where we really got into like, uh, I guess the nitty gritty of dentistry. So we would start to do um, more uh, fillings and crowns and make dentures and all the more lab work, kind of getting us ready for clinic. Uh, And then the summer between second and third year is kind of where we kind of started entering and shadowing in the clinic. Uh, And then third year is like a good mix of like 50-50 clinic as well as didactic. Although it's mostly, um, you know, you seeing patients, which is, like I said, the fun part, because, you know, you get to have your own patients and you develop relationships with them and you can kind of like, you know, make changes in their lives and everything like that. So it was really rewarding, kind of like all the suffering first and second Mm -hmm. year and all the stress of first and second year and all the exams you have to take kind of pays off in third year when you get to finally have your own patients. Uh, And then fourth year was like almost all clinic. So it's basically just kind of like getting your clinical requirements in, depending 
at least the way we had it at our school was you had to have a certain number of fillings and uh, crowns and procedures and teeth pulled and everything like that. So it's kind of just wrapping those things up. Um, and I think for both of us, we applied for ortho in, in between our third and fourth year. So you kind of need to, like we were saying earlier, I would start shadowing for sure during second year. And then during third year is when you really need to start getting like your letters of recommendation organized and kind of getting your application ready, make sure that you took the GRE um, or any other exams that are required. Uh, Cause you're actually gonna apply during uh, the summer of your third year. And then in your fourth year is actually when you go on interviews typically. Um, and that also can be somewhat expensive mm -hmm. depending on how yeah. many programs you apply to and how many interviews you go on. Okay, perfect. So I think we're like running out of time. So we would just like to thank you guys one more time because you took out um, time from your day to help us pre-dental students. And we really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. And for like anyone watching, like feel free to reach out to them and you can follow them on their Instagram page. And yeah, that's all I have to say. It's our pleasure, guys. Yeah, yeah best of luck with everything. Yeah. We were in your shoes at one point yeah. and you guys will be in our shoes one day. So just keep up the good work and Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.